This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, we're privileged uh, from the Heart and Vascular to have uh, Dr. Araklis Papinos with us today. He's a professor of surgery as well as uh, cell biology at uh, University of Nebraska. He has an active vascular surgery practice at the uh, Omaha VA, and he has been an invested student and teacher of uh, myopathy and peripheral arterial disease. I first got to hear Dr. Pepino's talk, I believe, uh, when he had his KO8 award. And he's the perfect blend of a fabulously generous collaborator and a person who mentors and always seeks mentorship. And he has put together one of the really world-class um, skeletal muscle biology laboratories, and this is uh, at the University of Nebraska Omaha. He's going to show a lot of his uh, really fascinating work. And um, as the Heart and Vascular Center becomes more of a heart and vascular center, I think uh, you all uh, will see some of the interesting overlaps and perhaps some differences in the lower legs compared to other uh, vascular beds. Um, our plug for the legs is that if you look at the leg, it's 18% one leg of your body surface area. You put two of those legs together and you're about 40%. And if you look at all the muscle in your body, and if you think muscle is more than just the tissue and perhaps has some biologic function uh, big, uh, the muscle in the legs is probably around almost 60% of all the muscle in our body. And so you could imagine if you have that inflamed, just like an inflamed liver or an inflamed lung, it can impact everything. And so it's a uh, truly a, a once, uh, once a year, once a couple years opportunity for me to be with Heraclis and to talk to him and learn from him. And we're very appreciative for you being here. In the words of Hamilton, the musical, uh, Professor Pepinos comes to us from Greece. So immigrants, they get the job done. Thank you very much, Dr. Brewster. I, I've known Dr. Brewster for about 12 years. Uh, he's a wonderful surgeon scientist, and he's correct. I've, uh, I've been the beneficiary of some of the most wonderful mentorship from him. Um, I am honored to now hopefully initiate a collaboration with your division. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you about uh, advances and new frontiers in uh, PAD. Um, I like uh, usually to start uh, for uh, the younger members of the audience by showing uh, arteriograms of a, uh, a normal, healthy person here in the top and a person with PAD. So um, uh, the concept of occlusive disease is easy to then understand. And this is the patient's pelvis. This is a trauma patient. This is the uh, thigh bone and the knee. And you can see how the arteries uh, come here into the groin. And this is the profunda femoral artery. And this is the superficial femoral. And um, you can see here that this segment of superficial femoral artery is occluded in this patient. You can also see that um, all of these collateral pathways are very nicely developed. But as I tell my uh, patients, um, once they, the big highway is blocked, you can have detours, and they may do some good work, uh, but it is not the same as um, the, the main highway being open. Um, so there's a lot of uh, um, similarities between um, coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease. And I will not go too much into the detail, but patients that have stable angina, chest pain on exertion, a similar symptom in the leg is called claudication, which is um, the patients have no pain while they're resting, but once they start walking, the muscles are asking for blood that cannot be delivered due to the blockages and then um, they start having pain. Um, 
uh, pain at rest is called unstable angina in the um, CAD and is called rest pain in PAD. And then when you have necrosis, uh, loss of structural integrity, um, you, uh, it is called a heart attack and it's called tissue in, in the heart and it's called tissue loss gangrene in the leg. Now, um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about how PAD is treated because uh, this is the foundation of why um, our uh, group and Dr. Brewster's group is doing um, this type of work. And here you can see the patient's uh, abdomen and the aorta dividing to the two uh, iliac arteries. One of the most common areas developing this atherosclerosis is the aortic bifurcation. And you can see that it is treated with this nice prosthetic graft. And I like to tell to our medical students that this looks beautiful and simple and straightforward, but I would like to actually show you how this operation is done and what is involved. So this is a patient we did an orthobifemoral bypass a few weeks ago, and um, you can see here is the groin incisions outlined and the incision that we will do in the belly. And um, this is um, the patient in full exposure. You can see we're uh, using this uh, self-retaining retractor, uh, both for the groins and for the abdomen. And what you can see here is because the aorta is situated all the way in the back, um, we have to essentially pull the uh, bowels out of the belly and they are retracted uh, by this retractor here. You can see the bowel is in this plastic bag here. And you can see we have retractors that pull the liver uh, and the stomach and spleen and the colon out of the way so we can get down to the aorta, which is right there in the middle. And then we develop these paths for the grafts to go through that go all the way in the back of the pelvis and come out into the groin. And here um, we is the proximal anastomosis. This is the hookup between the aorta the aorta is coming down here. So at the very top is the chest, and here is the aorta coming down. This is actually the kidney, the left kidney vein crossing the aorta. And this here that you can see here, a little bluish, this is the vena cava. And this is the proximal anastomosis to this textile graft with the two limbs. The limbs are then channeled uh, in the pelvis, and you can see here the two limbs going into the back of the pelvis, coming out into the groins, and uh, being anastomosed to the uh, groin arteries. So I think uh, this operation, rather big operation, associated with substantial risk, both for morbidity and mortality, is an example of why we need to keep looking uh, at uh, the pathophysiology of PAD, trying to understand more of what's happening, possibly uh, developing new treatment methods uh, that can either help the operations or even move the operations uh, away and uh, uh, apply to our patients. So we all know that both coronary artery disease and PAD in, in both Everything starts with blockages in the arteries. However, it takes a simple histological evaluation, and this is actually the reason I like very much the work we do in the lab. It takes just a simple histological evaluation of skeletal muscle to see that there is a lot more happening uh, than just simple uh, blockages. Let me go over a little histology. This is skeletal muscle, uh, normal muscle, and you can see that basically the myofibers uh, here in transverse uh, cut, they have similar shape and size. They are polygonal cells, and they are arranged in, in th that have these peripherally located nuclei, and they are arranged in groups called the myofascicles, and you can see another myofascicle here, that, have, that are surrounded by thin perimesium, this extracellular ma matrix. 
Now, let me show you what happens to muscle in uh, PAD. This um, uh, patient here is a patient with claudication. The muscle looks very close to normal, but if you pay attention, there is some myofibers that are very small, like uh, uh, this one here, and there is some myofibers that are a little more like needle-shaped, like this and this, and a few myofibers where the nuclei are not in the periphery, but they're in the center. So just very mild changes, um, pretty close to normal. This is another patient with claudication who is a little worse. Now, not only we have these abnormal looking myofibers here that are very small, but then we have some that are abnormally big. One of the first things that happens in myopathy is you have what is called the wide distribution of myofiber size. So um, we start from um, regular shape and size, and then we have smaller and bigger, so a wider distribution. But then what happens is if you look at these bigger myofibers, these are abnormal myofibers, and they have on the inside what is called target lesions, and our group is interested in these target lesions because they appear to be um, uh, damaged um, macromolecules and organelles that are accumulating in the muscle and they cannot be cleared easily. And then we have um, uh, myofibers that are very abnormal, looking like these three, and this is called myofiber necrosis with myophagocytosis. And basically, the myofiber is dying, and inflammatory cells enter the fiber to clean the fiber um, out of the system. And this patient here is a little worse. Not only we have everything I showed in the previous picture, but we have this finding. This is what makes it worse. So uh, this is fibrosis. So you can imagine that not only the myofibers are degenerated, but they are stuck, uh, they are choked by scar tissue. So that once fibrosis starts, fibrosis is tremendously interesting. I'm gonna show you a few data in a little bit. Um, then you have a totally new level of malfunction, both in the heart and in the leg. This patient here is even a little worse. Um, you know, we have everything we showed before. You can see some of these target lesions. You can see this one is having a vacuolization. We have big time fibrosis and also some fatty replacement here. But what makes this even worse is the finding right here. This thing here used to be a myofascicle like this. So if you take this fascicle and you remove all the red, what is left is small cells with a bunch of nuclei, okay? So this is called group atrophy here, and you can see group atrophy also here. Uh, the myofascicle has disappeared and is getting replaced by fibrous tissue. And these patients here are even worse. This is called end-stage myopathy, and you can see that the muscle essentially gets totally replaced by uh, fat and uh, scar. Um, and it is it's difficult to visualize how some of these people with so little uh, myofiber structure um, uh, walk, but they do. So let me show you how this thing looks uh, at the CT scan. And I'm, uh, I'm constantly humbled by the mentoring I get from many people. Um, sometimes the most important mentors pointing things out to me are our medical students. And I remember when, um, when vascular surgeons look at a CT scan, all we look at is these th structures here. These are the blood vessels with the contrast inside them. We very rarely look at anything else. And I remember I was talking to, I, I was in front of a, a CAT scan uh, showing the vascular system and telling the students about uh, myopathy. And the medical student says, Doc, this here is the myopathy. And let me show you what he showed. This is a normal person, again, a trauma patient. This is 65 years old. You can see here is the cross section across the calf. This is the tibia and the fibula. And you see the three arteries of the calf, anterior tibialis, peroneal, 
and posterior tibial. And then you can see this gray tissue here, homogeneously nice gray tissue. This is the muscle. And this is fat, okay? Now, let me show you what happens in patients with claudication. Here is um, some moderate, mild to moderate changes. You can see this marbling um, that we have here in the anterior compartment muscles and in the gastrocnemius, and a little less in the deeper muscles. And actually, talking about marbling, one of our collaborators at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln has a new device that essentially is being used to evaluate marbling in um, steaks. So it can tell uh, the quality of a steak using this special camera without even opening the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, animal leg. So we're hoping to develop uh, devices like that to assess in a non-invasive or minimally invasive fashion the actual marbling in, in the PAD. So changes uh, that you can see in the um, CT scan, and here is a patient with uh, even worse changes, okay? And uh, a patient with end-stage myopathy here. Now, take a look at this. This is fat, this is gastrocnemius, this is soleus. Not very different, okay? So, um, and I am sure the heart looks quite similar as coronary artery disease is developing. So, um, the, what I'm trying to share, and, and my talk could, could stop uh, here and say the PAD physiology is much more complex than a simple imbalance between blood supply and demand due to blockages. There is a lot more happening. And I showed you the histological findings, which consist of myofiber degeneration and fibrosis. I'm gonna show you now a little bit about the uh, principal features at the ultrastructure physiology and biochemistry. And this is work that was started, of course, um, uh, many great things start with cardiologists looking into it, and that is one of the most wonderful things that is happening to vascular surgery. I think our association with cardiologists is pushing forward both our understanding of disease and the treatment of disease. And this work um, was started about 15 um, uh, years ago by a, uh, two cardiologists Dr. William, uh, Dr. Hyatt, and Dr. Brass, who showed that there is mitochondrial dysfunction in patients uh, with arterial disease. Um, then more work now is showing that there's oxidative damage and inflammation. So let me tell you about mitochondrial function. Um, the um, normal mitochondria from uh, our biochemistry, it has the complexes one, two, three, four, five. Uh, protons are being pumped across, electrons are being transferred, oxygen is consumed, and at the end, ATP is produced. Now, what's happening in claudication is we have malfunction of complexes one, three, and four. And this does two things that it's both, it's measurable. Um, number one, ATP production decreases, okay? so. These patients, not only they don't get enough blood, um, so not only they don't get enough nutrients and oxygen, but the little that gets to their leg cannot be translated normally to ATP because of the mitochondrial dysfunction. And the second thing that happens is that as electrons go through this dysfunctional uh, uh, electron transport chain, they leak. Um, so you have electron leakage, which gets picked up by oxygen and develops these oxygen radicals. And this brings us to oxidative damage. Uh, our group has shown that uh, measuring two indices of oxidative damage, carbonyls and hydroxinone and now that uh, in control uh, here in blue, uh, levels of oxidative damage is significantly lower than uh, in PAD in red. We have also shown 
that the smaller the myofiber, the higher the level of the damage. So it looks like as oxidative damage accumulates, the uh, myofibers get smaller. And this is a representative picture of oxidative damage in the muscle. Uh, here you have the control muscle, and here the PAD. And you can see there is a lot more labeling in the PAD muscle, a lot more brightness. You can also see that overall, the myofiber size is smaller in the PAD. You can see here these target lesions uh, in two or three places. And you can see how target lesions have more oxidative damage, which uh, is consistent with the theory I told you that these, there's damaged organelles and micromolecules that accumulate cannot be cleared. You can also see that these smaller myofibers have more labeling than the bigger myofibers. Okay, so I, um, this is um, a very interesting finding also, is this. So the, in controls, the levels of oxidative changes um, are smaller than in patients with claudication, which are smaller than patients with rest pain, which are smaller than those seen in patients with tissue loss. Uh, and gangrene. Um, uh, this is data we just put together um, analyzing the um, five-year survival rate of patients w uh, with PAD. And what we have shown, what we are seeing here, and this is data that are produced uh, by Dr. Kutakis, uh, who was, uh, did his PhD and postdoc in our laboratory, and now he's in independently funded R01 investigator at um, Florida State, and he's working with Dr. Brewster also, he, another um, a member of our team enjoying the mentorship of Dr. Brewster. And what we are showing here is that if you are in the lowest tertile for level of damage in your muscle, then the chance you will be alive at five years is 94%. But if you are in the middle or higher uh, level of damage, the chance you'll be alive in five years is 44 and 38%. So levels of damage in the leg uh, are associated, I'm not showing this data here, but they're associated with um, function uh, and Dr. McDermott's group has shown that clearly, and they're associated with mortality also. How are they associated with mortality? It is um, a little, um, it is not very well explored, but our group and Dr. Brewster is working to understand that also. Now, how about inflammation? Very little has been done in inflammation. We're making a little progress. I'm gonna show you a little histology here. Uh, inflammatory cells can be seen in the muscle, not very often, but when they are seen, they're either inside the myofiber, as you can see here, or in between. And in rare occasions, you have kind of more uh, accumulation of inflammatory cells, like you can see here, and that is usually happening around um, microvessel hubs. Now, our group, uh, one of our residents, uh, Jonathan Thompson, uh, who now has joined us, uh, joined our group, has done the first work on actually looking at cytokines in skeletal muscle. This was not straightforward, but my partner, Dr. Casal, has developed now a technique to measure um, with ELISA in skeletal muscle inflammatory cytokines. Here on the top, is patients with PAD and here uh, with, and claudication. These are claudicating patients, and these are patients that are controls. And you can see that uh, out of these, uh, all of these cytokines we measured, essentially all of them um, were significantly elevated compared to control. Now, the cytokine that is most consistently and has the biggest difference in ter terms of elevation is TGF-beta-1. Now, TGF-beta-1 
is a cytokine that we are very interested because of this fibrosis I showed you. So the question we had was, where is TGF produced um, in the muscle? And here is control plodicating patients in CLI. These are characteristic images um, uh, showing the uh, progressively increasing fibrosis. Is this uh, clock correct? Yes, uh, right. Um, so the blue is uh, collagen accumulation. Uh, so TGF-beta is the major profibrotic cytokines, cytokine. So we asked the question, where is it produced in skeletal muscle? And we thought it was going to be made by inflammatory cells or actually the myofibers themselves. But we were surprised to see this here. In green is TGF-beta, and it appears the entirety of TGF-beta appears to be produced by smooth muscle cells in uh, the microvessels of uh, the PAD muscle. And so this is a control specimen. And you can see thin um, uh, arterial and venules with uh, smooth muscle cells um, that are uh, having a small amount of TGF-beta. And this is um, a patient with claudication. And you can see the thickening of the microvessels and uh, the change in the character of the smooth muscle cells into this synthetic phenotype producing this TGF beta 1. And this is in CLI. And we just had this discussion about uh, microvascular disease. I think. The, the field of microvascular disease is extremely important. Both um, microvascular disease along with uh, macrovascular disease. In, in the field of cardiology, you can have epicardial stenosis and microvascular disease, or you can have microvascular disease without significant appreciable um, macrovascular epicardial stenosis. And it's the same thing in PAD, a highly unexplored field and that you can very easily demonstrate in PAD muscles. And I think it's worth a lot of um, further exploration. Now, what I want to show you here with this image is that these changes in the microvessels happen in these uh, <clears throat> The vessels, the uh, microvessels you see here are about two to 300 microns, okay? So in this image now, I, we have uh, uh, microvessels, here is control, and this is PAD, uh, stage four PAD. And <clears throat> you can see the microvessel changes both in bigger arterioles and venules, and then smaller, 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 all the way down to arterioles. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> there is even some, uh, what is called a phenomenon called muscular, muscularization of normally non-muscularized microvessels. Okay, so you have these uh, <clears throat> smooth muscle cells or pericytes that are increased in um, numbers. And in this picture here, <clears throat> it's a piece of, a bigger piece of muscle. And you can see in the red, the TGF beta production. And you can see it all over from bigger vessels all the way to very little uh, vessels. I want to also show you a picture of the capillaries and um, our uh, PhD student, Constance Mietus, actually has completed a piece of work with my partner, Dr. Casal, which uh, basically it shows that when you're looking at the capillaries of normal um, skeletal muscle, they're thin, um, <clears throat> as you can see here. But when you look at them in patients with PAD, 
there is thickening of these capillaries. And uh, like I mentioned, the number of pericytes also increases in them. So there is failure of perfusion at many, many levels, both in coronary and peripheral artery disease. Um, so how can we put this together? The essentially PAD starts with blockages in, uh, in big arteries. And these blockages produce ischemia, sometimes at rest, um, more frequently with exercise. So you have ischemia when you walk, you stop, now you have reperfusion. So we have two things happening. We have the ischemia and we have ischemia reperfusion. Every time you have that, you have an initiation of oxidative damage. And then this produces mitochondrial damage and initiates inflammation. And this damage of the PAD limb affects every tissue in the leg. Okay, it's not, the muscle, we're very interested in muscle because of its functional significance. But every tissue, the skin, the soft tissues, the subcutaneous tissue, the nerves are all involved. And then, as a result, you have the PAD manifestations, which is claudication, rest pain, and tissue loss gangrene. And I like to show pictures of PAD legs because they demonstrate exactly this. So the younger members uh, of the audience, the classic description of a PAD leg is this thin sarcopenic leg with hairless uh, skin. So the skin is affected, is damaged, and is thinner. It has lost all of its protective mechanisms. It has no hair, has no oil glands, the, even the sweat um, uh, process, sweating process is reduced. So you have this dry, thin skin. The subcutaneous tissue is gone. And basically, you have bones with a thin layer of skin on top of it. And you can see how a small injury then can produce the gangrene that you can see here in the toe. And this is a, another patient here. Again, look at these um, thin legs. And he was wearing a boot that was a little tighter here around the ankle, which cut this ulcer. And this patient got an aortobifemoral bypass. And this is three months later, the wound has healed. So myofiber degeneration, fibrosis, oxidative damage are central pathophysiologic features in the myopathy of PAD. How do they respond to standard treatments like revascularization operations and supervised exercise therapy? Our group has just completed a, um, a study that I want to share with you. We hypothesized that revascularization operations and standard supervised exercise therapy improve the myopathy of PAD limbs in association with improvements of leg function and quality of life. This is not a randomized trial. This is parallel recruitment without randomization. Every patient would see <clears throat> the vascular surgeon, discuss the options, and choose either exercise therapy or <clears throat> or by or uh, revascularization. We had 41 patients undergoing, all of them are claudication patients. 41 patients undergoing open or endovascular revascularization and 42 <clears throat> undergoing standard supervised exercise therapy per American Heart Association guidelines. What is the prescription for standard exercise therapy? It is 30 to 45 minutes of supervised sessions of repeated cycles of treadmill walking to moderate severe discomfort, followed by rest at least three times per week for six months. So the patients get on the treadmill, they walk until they have a bunch of pain, then they rest. Walk again until they get a bunch of pain in their legs, rest. And they do that for 30 to 45 minutes. So um, the assessments, um, were at baseline, 
and after six months. <clears throat> and we uh, evaluated limb hemodynamics, walking distances, quality of life, and uh, we did this uh, needle base. This is a Bergstrom needle, is a six millimeter needle that we do um, calf muscle biopsies with. And we measured myofiber morphometrics, oxidative damage, mitochondrial function, and fibrosis. So here we have uh, a comparison of demographics. And when you look at these patients, in terms of demographics, comorbidities, medications, the patients undergoing revascularization versus exercise therapy are not different. Uh, when you look at them in terms of myopathy, though, you see that they are a little different. For example, this is six minute walking distance and this is peak walking time on treadmill. You can see the uh, patients undergoing surgery uh, are a little worse than those going into uh, exercise therapy. You can see that their myofiber size is smaller. And you can see that the aspect ratio is higher, which the, the higher the aspect ratio, the more irregular, the less polygonal uh, the uh, size. Um, you can see that the level of oxidative damage is more. And you can see that they have more uh, leg fibrosis and uh, that the overall, their quality of life uh, on questionnaires and this is the uh, standard form, SF36 uh, subcomponents on physical function and uh, pain. And this is the walking impairment questionnaire, is overall worse. So you can see that <clears throat> when the patients go to the clinic, there's a little bit of a bias. Although they do not look different on paper, the, paper, the people that are uh, more severe tend, and their surgeons, tend to choose operating rather than exercise, okay? So let's look at outcomes of revascularization. First, six minute walking distance and peak walking time substantially increased, okay? Um, as you can see here, co all quality, and these are representative, there's a ton of endpoints that we're measuring. I'm showing some representative ones here. The quality of life parameters all improved across the board substantially. The question is, is muscle morphology and pathology improved at the same time? The answer is yes. The myofiber size, actually within six months, we were able to see a trend um, in, in increasing myofiber size, decreasing uh, my, uh, aspect ratio, so both the size and the shape became a little more normal. And significant improvement in mitochondrial function, a significant drop in the levels of oxidative damage, and um, a, an, um, but no change in fibrosis. So fibrosis, we have not found any treatment that can improve fibrosis. Uh, even surgery just appears to be stabilizing fibrosis or making it move very slowly, uh, if any. So um, I, when I show this data on the improvements, um, all surgeons are uh, amazed and very happy that our treatment are a phenomenal thing. And I remember actually, um, and let me show you actually the, the data. This is after <clears throat> revascularization changes in peak walking time on treadmill. And what you can see here is this is a, uh, a graph of equivalence. This is peak walking time at baseline. This is six months later. And this is the line of equivalence. If you're on the line, you uh, have um, not changed. If you're above the line, you have increased your walking time. If you're below the line, you have decreased. You can see that on average, there is a substantial improvement in walking time. But this improvement is driven by these people here in blue. There is about 
40%, a little more than 40% of patients that do not change. And I remember the first time I had a clue this is happening was I was in the, um, in the clinic, the patient comes, he says, Doc, we, just, we had just done a fem pop, I think, on this patient. I said, Doc, uh, I'm cured. Like, uh, you know, can you walk? He says, Doc, miles. I can walk miles. And we were just high-fiving each other. We, you know, like, we're like amazing people. We do this surgery. So the medical student said, um, uh, can we measure the walking distance? I said, of course, but the man can walk miles. And he said, I'm going to take him and do a measurement. And the patient's walk, the baseline walking was 300 meters maximum. And after bypass, it was 350 meters. And I was like, that cannot be true. I mean, this is impossible. But the patients feel a lot better, but their walking distance does not improve. So what does that mean uh, we're working on this? But what I'm showing here is that group one does not change very much. And the difference is driven by these people. About 50 or 60% of the patients are driving the, the change. And this, I am certain, is similar to what happens with revascularization in the heart. Um, I shouldn't say I'm certain. I suspect uh, is similar. And this is, again, the same uh, uh, graph with six-minute walking distances. And again, you can see the um, no change in about 40 to 50% of the patients. And the difference overall, however, patients do much better, substantially uh, more walking. So how about standard supervised exercise therapy? Um, the patients walk a lot more. Actually, the increase in the peak walking time is higher with exercise therapy than uh, after revascularization. But we do not see a, an improvement in the six-minute walking distance. And um, some people, including Dr. McDermott, thinks that this may be reflective of a, an exercise component, a, uh, the fact that they're getting used to walk more on a treadmill. Um, and that is why the peak walking time, which is measured on a treadmill, is showing such a big improvement. But the six-minute walking distance does not in our uh, hands and others. The quality of life also improves, not as much as after uh, revascularization, but it does improve. So the question is, is myopathy improving? And what we found that it does not. It actually worsens after exercise therapy. Several of the parameters are worse, like this standard deviation of myofiber size. You remember I told you there is a wider distribution of myofiber size. Um, this is getting worse. The aspect ratio is getting worse. Uh, the mitochondrial function does not improve. I was expecting mitochondria will improve with exercise, but they don't. And fibrosis is getting much worse. And these myofibers in the lower quartile, this is a measurement of the smaller myofibers and is very sensitive at sh showing worsening of myopathy. You can see that <clears throat> the lower quartile fiber size drops substantially. Now, um, interestingly, as we were looking at the histology of these people, our postdoctoral fellows that were doing the project came up to myself and Dr. Casal and said, you know, some of these patients are visibly worse. So there is a visible worsening in some of these patients. So we separated the patients in two groups. Number one, patients with visible, uh, microscopically visible, wor severe progression of myopathy. And the group two, patients with 
mild or no progression of myopathy. So about 40% of patients are visibly worse. So what does that mean? So look at this patient. Here is the trichrome, and you can see how <clears throat> the myofiber size gets significantly smaller. And the amount of fibrosis in blue gets significantly worse. I am not talking about a finding, a measurement. Uh, I'm talking about visibly worse histology. So, and here is oxidative damage labeling. And again, you can see overall the myofiber size is decreasing and the amount of labeling in the myofibers is worsening. This is another patient with similar findings. More labeling, worse histology, more fibrosis. And another example here, and you can see this wider distribution of myofiber size, small and huge myofibers. And another patient. So are these groups different? Well, when you look at them in terms of comorbidities and medications used, no, they're not different. When you look at them in terms of myopathy, they're uh, v very much different. The, these group two patients, they have no progression. Their myopathy findings are actually, uh, some of the myopathy improves. For example, the, this, in this uh, subgroup, the myofiber size increases overall, um, uh, both in the overall and in the lower quartile. But if you look at these group one um, patients that have this severe progression, almost all myofiber and fibrosis parameters worsen in a measurable fashion. And then, um, so we are showing that exercise therapy can induce severe calf muscle damage in 40% of PAD patients enrolled in our study. Is this associated with PAD functional <coughs> outcomes? Meaning, if you get a bunch of damage, do you walk less? Well, when we are looking at the claudication onset time and the peak walking time on treadmill, the answer is no. Both groups, those that get damaged and those that don't, walk a lot more on treadmill. But when you're looking at six minute walking distance, there is a trend for significant worsening of the six minute walking distance in the patients that have progression of disease. So if you were just, if you send your patient for exercise therapy and you just look at how much they walk on treadmill, you may have the false perception that everything is coming along great. As a matter of fact, look at this. The post-exercise therapy number here is higher than this number. So some of these people walk a lot more, yet their muscle sustains substantial damage. So um, how about differences in quality of life? This is reflected in quality of life. So the patients feel this and put this down on questionnaires, meaning the patients that have muscle prog uh, damage progression say when they're asked that their quality of life has not improved, yet their walking distances have improved a ton. Okay. Um, now I want to close with this finding of fibrosis. Fibrosis is very important. <clears throat> Nobody knows how it works exactly. We're doing some work on this. This is with revascularization. You can see uh, the change did not reach statistical significance, and this is with exercise. So exercise makes fibrosis worse. So uh, conclusions, standard exercise therapy improves the walking performance. However, improvement is associated with pathologic changes of myofibers um, after completion of the training program. Severe changes are seen in the calf muscle of 40% of patients who completed treatment. 
We view these effects on PAD muscles as a consequence of ischemia reperfusion damage to lower extremity muscles produced by repeated bouts of exercise to moderate severe discomfort. So during exercise, we push the patients to walk to severe discomfort. That means a ton of ischemia. So when you push the patients to make their muscles ischemic, then stop and reperfuse. Ischemic reperfuse. Ischemic reperfuse. Some people are resistant to this ischemia reperfusion. Some are not. What makes some people good candidates for exercise therapy versus others that are not? We're working on it. It's not very simple. Our findings suggest a need for modification of the current prescription of uh, supervised exercise therapy for PAD patients. The benefits and risks of the current standard of exercise therapy for PAD patients merits further research so <clears throat> that the physiological responses of PAD patients to exercise therapy can be better understood and our ability to tailor the therapy for different patients can be optimized. Revascularization operations improve limb hemodynamics, reduce oxidative stress, and improve myofibromorphometrics morphometrics and mitochondrial function in association with improved limb function and quality of life. Our data confirmed that limb revascularization is an effective therapeutic intervention that improves the myopathy and limb function of PAD patients. A rigorous exercise training program is not as beneficial as revascularization operations in the care of PAD patients. <clears throat> and our current work, we're looking into the effects of treatments on the myopathy and walking ability of PAD patients. So we're looking at revascularization, supervised exercise therapy, treatment with Ramipro, um, <clears throat> um, adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells, and this is work that um, on a, the PIG project that was initiated in this university by Dr. Brewster. He uh, put together the first um, swine model of PAD in association with Dr. Leffer. Um, and we're using the model to study stem cells. And uh, <clears throat> we have done also some work with uh, bone marrow derived stem cells. We're working on neuromodulation of the pain of claudication. And we're working on the use of exoskeleton devices. So if you cannot improve the myopathy, can you use exoskeletons that provide a low assistance with walking to increase walking distances? And we do a lot of basic work, both on ankle-based exoskeletons and hip-based exoskeletons. <clears throat> so I have shown you the myopathy. Muscle is getting worse. The question is, can we reverse it? And this is our team. Thank you. So, um, so what what is the right exercise therapy program, and, and what endpoints do you use? Do you do it by low levels of pain, or you do cutaneous oxygen, or I mean, what 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 do you think is the if you have to modify, what do you think what do you think you would do? I think um, this is a very good question, and it it shows that you know uh, your insight into uh, the appropriate parameters here. I think. Um, our hypothesis is that probably a milder exercise therapy, because our theory is that the damage is produced by ischemia in the muscle, uh, we theorize that a milder exercise will probably produce some of the exercise benefits without as much damage. Um, no one knows, um, but Groups like yours uh, with Dr. Brewster and ours and uh, Dr. McDermott um, and others, uh, hopefully our, um, uh, Dr. Kutakis is also looking into uh, some of this work, will hopefully be able to start dissecting some of the questions. And I know <clears throat> also Dr. Brewster wants to use his swine model to look into um, 
different types of exercise therapy. So it is important to note that the work we have done used a specific exercise prescription. This is the American Heart Association recommended prescription. There is other prescriptions that we have not evaluated. There may be other prescriptions for exercise therapy that do not produce this damage while maintaining all the benefit. So this is where we need to go next. Fascinating. Uh, let me uh, help me understand whether this is as radical a uh, finding and recommendation as it sounds like to me because I, I'm led to believe that the first treatment is exercise training. Mm -hmm. and that's a recommendation of AHA, ACC, and everything. And you're really challenging that. Uh, is the recommendation based on the fact that you've got an un, uh, unblindable endpoint? that you teach people how to, you know, they walk, they practice something, they get better at practicing it, and yet nothing is really getting better. Are we, are we fall, have we fallen into a trap of just, what, what were the recommendations for exercise training, which as I hear people who deal with this now and again say, no, no, we, exercise is what we do first. If that fails, we go to- Correct. Actually, uh, some things improve and that is the peak walking time on treadmill. So if you, if you take a PAD patient and you exercise them, with every session, the amount of walking on that treadmill increases. And that is a tremendous uh, finding. And, but if you stop there, exercise is phenomenal. When you look at the muscle, 40% of patients with the standard prescription have severe worsening of their muscle histology. Can you ignore that? I don't think we can, but uh, this is the first time we're doing this work. We are big exercise believers and proponents, and then we have this finding. I think, in my opinion, this finding should um, lead us in a pathway of reevaluating what is that we are doing with exercise. Yeah. If you could blind them, uh, if, if you could give them some amnesia agent so they didn't know that they had walked uh, how far on the treadmill, the, you know, the question knows. then would be <laughs> impossible. Great question. Yeah. Nobody knows. I love the, pic the picture uh, that, you know, you always love things that support your biases. I love the picture showing the degree of myopathy and survival. I mean, you know, claudication in general is benign, yeah. right? Four to 10% progress to critical limb ischemia or critical limb threatening ischemia. But are there ways to find who these people are and save them before they get there? I mean, it's gotta be a future. And I think, you know, I think you're pushing the boundaries and also the responder, non-responder. I mean, it's terribly exciting. Great presentation. Yeah. Since we have 60, 40 percent difference, is it that if we do a larger study, we may start identifying that what is the difference in these 40, 60 percent? Is it diabetes, chronic kidney disease? Yeah. Or is it the collateral circulation that is not that robust? Yes, this is, it. Uh, this is, an, this is the most important next question. It cannot be answered easily by um, a single center. It's gonna take a lot more patients exactly as you pointed out. Uh, and this is why I would like to keep working with Dr. Brewster and Dr. Taylor to dissect some of these questions. The answer is not going to be easy. It's not gonna be simple like, oh, the diabetics don't do better. No, it's, it's not gonna be that simple. It appears that there's gonna be a combination of endpoints, including performance, quality of life, hemodynamics, and myopathic component. It's gonna be a conglomerate, a combination of endpoints that will point to a person saying, you know, Dr. Taylor will benefit from exercise, 
pepinos will not, needs an operation. Um, so we do not have this answer yet, but the question you're asking is critical. And it's always both. Or, or bo yes. And another thing I, that you, you know, the more I do this work, the more I realize what Dr. Brewster said, claudication is not benign. Every time you walk and your muscle becomes severely ischemic, this is somehow communicated to the body. It could be through nerves to the brain, and then the brain tells the body things are not well. It could be through cytokines. It could be through oxidative reactive oxygen species. I'm not sure how it is, but let me give you something that Dr. Brewster showed actually in swine. If you take a pig and you put a blockage in the right leg, and then um, two months later you harvest muscle from the two legs, the one with normal flow and the one with abnormal flow, they both have damage. The one with the abnormal flow, a lot more damage, but the other is not normal. Why is the muscle in the leg with normal flow not totally normal? How is the damage communicated from this leg, the right leg, to the non-ischemic leg? Could this damage be communicated to the heart, the liver, the brain, the kidneys? Is it making the pig overall sicker? I think the answer is probably yes. And we need to, nobody has a clue how this th is happening, but when the leg is sick, is ischemic, uh, it communicates a lot of badness to the rest of the body. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.